All right. Just want to make sure that this works before we get started. Let's uh, make sure all our mics are on. Okay, well, we have everything. Um, are you ready, brothers and sisters? Testing. Brothers and sisters, you are ready? Yes, we're ready. All right. Welcome to the Sunday Law Update, where we update you on where we are on Bible prophecy as they're fulfilling every single week from the books of Daniel and Revelation. Today, we're going to talk about the concept of the ecological conversion, ecological Sunday being reintroduced into society in a certain place. It was introduced before, but now it's being reintroduced, and we're going to talk about the Pope's message to COP28. Brothers and sisters, we're told that the final movements will be rapid ones, and in, in this, we must prepare for what is soon to come upon this world. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, we come before you in prayer. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us. We want to pray that you'll make this video viral all over the world, and we want to pray that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit. Give us your grace and your glory, and we thank you, Lord. Bless the Country Living segment in Jesus' name, amen. 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 As we always do for the first part of our program, we do the Country Living segment, and then we will get right into the Sunday Law Update, and we have with us, again, not only Pastor Davis, he'll be our or he'll be our other panelist, but we have a guest panelist all the way from Bermuda, but he is from New York, Pastor Hector Quinones. God bless you, brother and sister Richardson. God bless you. Having a little feedback with the mics. Okay. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, I have the privilege of bringing back my sister here from two weeks ago because I felt like your time got kind of shared and, and people didn't get um, the full, I think, essence of what we wanted to share with them and the challenges of country living and, I, and actually what's being done to work, you know, network. Yes. But um, before we begin, I want to make an announcement. Monday, this Monday at 7 o'clock, we're going to have an um, interview Zoom and on online with John Glick. Um, I know that it's been a couple of weeks that he was here with his family. You all remember him? Well, he's going to come back and he's going to do a Zoom and he's also going to do a question and answer. So um, in the back, Richard, if you could put up my information and you'll have that information from the Zoom. But my telephone number is 234 seven zero six nine two three three that's not it <laughs> we'll, we'll come up and we'll come back to it at the end and i'll make another announcement but um yes they they're going to bring it up so hopefully it's, it's going to come up on the screen thank you that's a good idea so without further ado, because we are on the timeline, so want to introduce yourself all over as if this is the first time, and everyone knows my husband, Jerry, right, Jerry? <laughs> Say hello, Jerry. <laughs> hello, Doris. <laughs> all right, here we go. Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Louise Daniels. Talk right I, into the mic. Yes, my name is Louise Daniels, and I'm here to just share with all of God's people, wherever you may be, the importance of preparing and getting into the country. And then once you're there, how you can begin to network with others to see that whatever you need done is done. And who do we have beside you? <laughs> uh, yes, hello, my name is Ebony Daniels. I am her daughter. Um, I am someone that is warming up to country living in the, when I was, a young person, I don't feel like I'm as a young of a person as I used to be. But, you know, in my 20s, I wasn't as much into country living and wanted to live in the cities. Um, but here of late, just seeing prophecies fulfilled and everything, um, it really brought home to me the importance of um, just preparing spiritually and practically for the things to come. So I have. Um, I, I still work in the city, but I'm preparing a, a place. Um, they've given me a spot on their property, and so I'm um, working on having my own little place. And your, little out place there. Is, <laughs> your little place is pretty nice. You can hear testing. Looks like 
my banner. You can hear the water behind your little cabin, your little abode, and yes, um, you're working on it. And also you've had um, young um, adults come to the property and spend the night. So yes. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty proud of you on the steps that you have taken already. And if we have time, we'll go through the challenges of working, networking with young people and moving out. But um, I'm going to turn it over right over to you. Yeah, and you're, and you're not the only one with that thought of, uh, you know, warming up to it. So don't, don't think you're alone. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> I've warmed up. I, yeah, I'm past that, but there are others, I'm sure, that are. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Praise the Lord. All right. And so some of the things that I want to say here and what both of you are saying is that, number one, country living is really something that you have to <clears throat> prepare for. Because once you get out into the country, you know, we, we moved to the country, I think, about 21 years ago. But being in the country does not mean that you're prepared for the country. And so there's really a preparation for those who are wanting to move to the country that really you should try to do before you get there. And so it's really all about being prepared. But uh, we moved out 21 years ago. And so now I would say that we are somewhat prepared, but there is still a whole lot of preparation that has to come. And so that's what's really important. You know, we are all cautioned to get out of the cities. And, you know, just as anything else in the Bible, we are told to get out. And it's, are we heeding the word to get out? In Proverbs 22, 3, it says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And so the question is, is, you know, we hear country living, but are we really preparing to get to the country in order that we may not have to go through a lot of the things that have already been predicted, we have already been told. We're told in Hebrews 11:7 that by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark, to the saving of his house. Now, just like Noah, we have been warned. Talk right and into Just like Noah, we have been warned. Are we preparing as Noah prepared the ark in order that we may not have to go through things and that we can be saved? That is a question to each and every one of us. They say that when the crisis, preparing for a crisis, there is a crisis that's coming. And the question is, are we individually preparing for that crisis? And in that crisis, they say our food, our water, and our heating source, our electricity may not be there. So the question is, if your water is turned off, if your electricity is turned off, what will you do? Are you prepared for that? We are out in the country, but guess what? Our water is pumped up to, we live on a hill. It's pumped up by electricity. And so we thought, well, what? And the electricity has gone off several times. And that if a storm comes, somehow the, water, you know, the electricity will go off. So when that comes, we decided down at the holding tank to put on the pipe a handle whereby we could get our water, you know, because it's coming down out of the hill by gravity flow. A manual pump? Yes. It's coming down the hill, and so we can collect the water. Should the electricity go off that pumps it up the hill, we can go and at the holding tank, just turn a faucet, and we can get our water out through that way. Mm -hmm. Yes. But also I want to say, too, that when you're out there, that took time so that you can know that if that happened, what to do. So that's why I always want to encourage people because when you move out into any different home, you're going to find different situations that you didn't think of. So Absolutely. no matter how prepared that you think you're going to be, when you get out there, you're going to go, oh my, I, I thought that I had this under control, but now I have to make adjustments. So the sooner you get out there, the better it would be so you can see those adjustments that you need to make. And I want to say too, always, Preparing is part of trusting in the Lord. Amen. That has to go first. So no matter what 
comes up, no matter what challenges you have, if your trust is in the Lord and you're dependent on the Lord, then, you know, he will provide a way. He will tell you what to do and the adjustments that you need to make. And there's a statement, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. And so we, Country Living has really taught us so many things. And actually, when we first got there, we did not have running water. And so we lived about four to five months without running water. And we would, this is a, a southern, tote water. We would go to Walmart with five, five gallon containers. And with two, two of those five gallon containers, we learned how to live. We also had a sanitation system of, you know, disposing of our waste, everything. And so I'm thankful for those four to five months where we had to just learn how to live like the Israelites, have a system, a sanitation system. I want to say 21 years, so we're not talking about two or three years ago or five years, and we're not talking about three years ago when things got really hot and all of us was like really, you know, encouraged to go. We're talking about 21 years ago, and you were a lot younger. Yes. So were you 21 years ago following the counsel of the church? That's what motivated you to get out there and to stay oh. out there? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, Ellen White says that it is far um, better for a family to get their children out of the cities where they are constantly beholding the works of men in order that they may learn the lessons of nature and be able to hear God speaking. And so when we saw our children, and I hate to say it, our son, we at first had had him at a kindergarten school just up the street. He came home, and excuse me, holding his crouch. And so we said, you know, we've got to get out of here because he saw it with the young, the young boys in kindergarten. You had a little swag going. <laughs> you started packing your bags. Huh? So we said, we have got to get out of here. And then when their bikes were stolen just from the front porch, we actually saw a little boy getting away with the bike. We said, it's time to go. <laughs> so it's... So you moved out in the country, and I also want to say, too, that I know that you and your husband, you, you started a medical missionary um, school training, and that was one of the, that is the first one that I, I attended, coming here, um, learning the present truth, because as growing up, I mean, I came into Adventist faith when I was in high school, but even in that, it wasn't a push for country living. Jerry, do you remember um, them talking about country living? But the Satterfields lived in the country, too, though. They did, yeah. Um, yeah, the first church that we were actually uh, affiliated with was some of the members were in the country, although the church was in the city. But, uh, yeah, and um, I, I can't say, though, my early church years, I mean, even as far back as 20 years ago that I was in a church, only I was in a church that was even... There was nowhere near that I was hearing anything about moving to the country. Yes. Uh, so I, I guess it's a matter of what conferences are teaching and, and how, that, how that works. But Absolutely. In fact, there's a little book from city to country where actually the general conference was involved in helping people around the country to find property and to move to the country because mm. they were heeding according to the mm -hmm. council. But... Um, wow. There came a time when people started getting away from the moving to the country, and so that in the in the general conference died down. And so today, you mm -hmm. know, you're really having to do that yourself. And now today, I want to say too that we're so tempted to stay in the city because now, as the pastor have shown, and even our experience, everything is convenient. It's harder. I mean, your job is there, your stores is there. You're, I mean, everything is right there in the city. It's like 15 minutes from everything. And so now when you go out, it's an hour out. But um, God wants us to live that life where he can speak to us more, to live that life in an environment where we can breathe fresh air, we can see his workings. In the city, everything, uh, most of the things is man-made, and we talked about that. Everything you go out is just man-made. It's like you can't look up and see the creator. You know, when you get up, you see um, cement, you see brick, you see, you know, 
billboards you see, you know, you don't, yes, yes, a lot of tempting, but so let's talk about your ministry, because I know we only have a few more minutes, because we want to network, so here at State Line, we do, part of the country living segment is for us to connect with people who are out in the country, but also to set up networks where we can help each other out. One thing that I have found, and I know you hit on it a little bit, the challenges is getting the support. So if you move out and you're just a one-man team or a husband and wife team, you need, you need help on a lot of projects and, um, and getting everybody together yes. and, and saving money and resources and knowledge and exchanging you know, education. That's a lot. And, and that's basically what my hubby and I have done, and I really th I'm thankful for my hubby because what we have done in the area, we're in the Pulaski, Tennessee area, mm -hmm. and in that area there are many people, Adventists, that are out in the country, and there is one dear military brother who we would be on the phone all the time, and you know, since he's been in the military, He's always looking at boots on the ground or whatever, all of this stuff, and letting us know about things that are going to happen. And so for years we were talking about, well, you know, we really need to get together and start an organization where we can help ourselves and help others. And so finally that has come to fruition in that uh, my hubby does all the emailing and, and the list is growing. When people hear about us, they are growing and they want to be a part of it. And so we start sending out, um, inviting people to come to educational meetings about country living, beekeeping, whatever, solar, you know, just all of the different things, canning. And so from that, then we decided as a group that, you know, we need to help one another. Mm -hmm. And so currently, right now, we are helping Sister Adrian. What's your, your group? Because you named uh, the coalition. The Country Living Coalition. Country Living Coalition. And I like that. And that's the same premises that, um, yes. yes. That, and so the yes. networking is really good. We even have a uh, couple that comes all the way from down in Alabama near Birmingham because they want to be a part of a group. And so what we are really suggesting is that if you're in an area, network together. Right. To because, come together. Yes. Uh -huh, and I think that's important. Like she's in the Pulaski area. I would be like somewhat close to you, but the Fayetteville area is more easier and um, Yes. It makes sense if you're about like an hour and a half, no more than two hours from your group. Because if it gets further out, then that's a three-hour drive, and then the three-hour, that's not as realistic. So, but when things happen, if you need support, if you can connect and get to know people right around in your environment, you're, where you're staying, that's, that's good. And um, I think, you know, according to the council, in terms of being able to help one another, I mean, everyone is thankful for the help that we're getting from each other. And like I said, we're currently going over, and I showed these pictures the last time. This was the a greenhouse that we got, and then the first year we planted greens. And Richard, you wanna change the, um, the screen? Thank you. And we were able to actually invite people to come up. Okay. Talk right into that mic. I'm sorry. I'm gonna get you. Yes. Okay, and. No, no, that's okay. And so um, this was when we first got our greenhouse and we invited a whole group of people that came and helped us in getting it ready. And then we planted the greens and God blessed us there. And now we are over almost to the trace, um, the Natchez trace, helping Adrian um, to actually finish her house. She had someone to come in and do the shale, but inside we're over there putting up the insulation, putting up the sheetrock. Is, is Adrian, is she single? Yes, she's, she's a single young woman, but she's actually living in an Adventist um, community. community, yes. But, you know, we feel that, hey, this is God's calling, you know, and she's a part of the group. And so we're over there helping her to finish her house. And everybody's excited. It's good fellowship. Men and women, we're all putting the insulation in, and it's, you know, just great. Many people are learning, you know, in terms of this experience. I see some familiar faces up there in the yes, picture, yes. but go ahead. Yes, and so <laughs> and that's the goal of what we have, education and then helping each other. And then we also um, share in our harvest, like at this last meeting, which was last Sunday or the 19th. 
um, November the 19th, you know, we bring different things. If you have something harvest that you have, like one brother, I don't know if many of you know of Leaf of Life. It's a, a life, an herb. And so he brought Leaf of Life to all of us, you know, to share with us. Different times people have brought potatoes, we have blueberries. Whatever we have, we are sharing because the time is coming. And and I can just go ahead, Jerry. No, I was just gonna say amen to that. That's that's very that's very um, noteworthy that uh, yes. you know that's uh, being, that, that's going on right now. So. And that's what we must learn to do is to really help one another and to share. Yes. And so it's just not limited to with your group. No. You can just start a group in your community, even if you're not in the country. You can start a group where people that in your neighborhood, as you would say, people that you talk to, people that you know that go to your church or people that you know that go close by, you know, and start just connecting, like you said, like baking bread together. We do that. And you have Amen. so much fun and fellowship canning. We're going to can tomorrow at my house. Um, Jerry doesn't know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> But he'll be, he'll be grateful. He'll be grateful. But we're going to can early in the morning. I heard you laughing back there, Brother Richard, <laughs> all the way out here. My, but you got to listen. You got to know your spouse. My husband is, is easy. And any time when you talk about good food in the kitchen and he's going to benefit, I've never seen him complain, <laughs> you know. But um, yes, but it's, it is, it is, it's fun at the same time. And plus you get to know people. Absolutely. It's not always just work. To me, um, Sister Palmer, what did you talk about country living? You said, and, and you said medical missionary. Please, hold on, I want you to say it because I thought this was so profound. <laughs> she said, oh my. <laughs> no, we're saying that country living, it is not an event. It is a lifestyle. It's a absolutely, lifestyle. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I have, a, I have a statement that I would like to read if I can, and I know it's probably finished. It says, and this comes from Great Controversy, it, is, it says, it is often the case that trouble, trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot really describe what is going to happen in the crisis that is before us. And so it behooves us like Noah is to listen, heed the warning that has been given and to adequately prepare so that we are not caught off guard like many others. Amen, amen. And it seems like pastor, he's ready. So without further ado, I wanna thank you, thank you. Thank you, and maybe I'll have you back once you, yes. you, <laughs> you come back so that you can tell your story. And I, I like to um, talk with people in the beginning, right. not all the time with people when they have arrived and they got this set up and everything. I think it's, it's more encouraging when you start off and you can say this is, and I can say the struggle in the Lord, trusting in God, and then you come back and you say, hey, this is how far the Lord has got me. Because when you move out in the country starting off, you are going to have sometimes have a little bit of that, I, I hate to say it, doubt, like, man, what have I gotten myself into? So you're going to have to trust the Lord no matter what. That, that's one thing that I can say that is part of the character development of um, starting this process for me is learning determination um, sometimes I've wanted to get things done in a certain time frame and have things happen quickly um, and repair people or the workmen that I wanted didn't come as quickly but I've had to have that patience and also determination that even if I didn't have someone else to do it I've had to do my own painting clearing of land like without power tools like just like handsaw and like you know but it's learning that Perseverance is something that will be helpful in the future because I'm sure there will be more trials, so just better learn to persevere now. <laughs> and, Amen. And I want to say real quick, like when you say time frame, we're not talking about like a week or two weeks. We're talking about sometimes it takes a year or 
three months, what you thought could be done in maybe a month or so, it's like, man, it's now been a year and we still haven't gotten it done. I don't know what it is of hiring outside help to come to the country property, but it's like you can't pay them enough to come. And then when they come, it's like, and, and, yeah, so we got to learn these skills on our own, and that Absolutely. will save us a lot of time and also an, and help with our resources too. So, Jerry, you have anything else to say? No, I look forward to canning tomorrow. <laughs> so I, like I got all the supplies. That means everything. I don't have to put that fencing up for the dogs? Or? No, see, while you're outside oh, doing that, oh. we're going to be inside yeah. doing the, the canning for the soup. But okay. um, anyway, could you have prayer okay, for us, I Jerry? I sure can. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the uh, wonderful folks who are here uh, spreading the the, the knowledge on country living and the need for us to actually get out there and get prepared. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here for the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Brother Jerry, I just need to get on the table right here. Three. Amen. Brothers and sisters, was, were you blessed by that country living talk? Amen. Understand this right here. Country living is not about hideout. It's about character development. Amen. And so, you know, um, as I was talking about it, you know, when you live in the city to be young, black, and from the inner city, you have to think the way inner city people think. Do you understand this? But when you go out into the country, you have to think a different way. Do you understand this? And one of the things that you will learn is we need each other in the country. Amen. Um, one of the problems that we have had uh, common was our water system. Does anybody, does anybody testify to something like that? All right. I mean, you don't realize, you know, when you're in the city, the water, I mean, it's like automatic, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, unless you don't pay your bill, right? But when you are in the uh, country and your water go out, you know, you need that helping hand. But I want to thank God that, you know, every time we've had any plumbing issues, we've always had somebody there um, available. And man, I found a, I found a good plumber. I mean, they some good, and they are just clockwork, and it's affordable. Amen. I don't know if you've had that issue, Jerry, but I tell you, man, I thank God for, for my plumber. Man, I just praise God too. Amen. And so we just praise God for the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. And we want to welcome you to the Sunday Law Update, updating you where we are in Bible prophecy. It's prophecy fulfilling right before our very eyes. Yes, and we're going to show you some things that are taking place right now, even as we speak, in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And today we have with us um, two wonderful people. Amen. Amen. We have Pastor, yes. Yeah, we're going to do that in a second. Yes, we have Pastor Sean Davis. Come on up, Brother Davis. Amen. And I got my good friend from Bermuda, amen, on loan, amen. But he was born and raised in a city called New York City, amen, amen. And that's Pastor Hector Quinones, amen. So we thank God for Pastor Q. We call, we call him Pastor Q in um, uh, Bermuda. So let me make sure you got the microphones on. Uh, make sure, let's see if you're on, Pastor Davis. Pastor Q, we'll make sure you're on, all right, amen. And at the end of our um, update, we'd like to ask for Sister Daphne if you can sing for us. Amen. I didn't I, just as long as I remember, I said, I got to have you sing. Amen. So Sister Daphne's going to sing a song for us. But before we, um, is your microphone working, Pastor? Can you just talk? Testing. Me? Okay. Keep talking to yours. Test. Test. Okay, good. All right. Amen. Amen. We just praise God for that. So before we um, get started, Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to pray that you'll bless this Sunday Law update. We want to pray that you would bless us as we come to the close of another Sabbath. Please forgive us of anything said and done that was displeasing in thy sight. We pray for the manifestation of your spirit and your power and your presence. Give us your grace to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, um, are we in the end of time? Pastor Q, how close are we to the end of time? Well... If we want to look prophetically and uh, to ascertain how close we are, 
All we need to do is look at the seals, look at the trumpets, and look at the seven candlesticks. And every single one of them point, point to the fact that we are somewhere between the six and the beginning of the seventh of one of those three. Okay, obviously we are in the time of the seventh candlestick, Laodicea, the church that is to be judged, or the time of the judgment. Obviously we're also somewhere around the sixth seal, because the, final, the last seal, there is nothing, there is no sound, there's, heaven is quiet, so Jesus is coming. We know not the day or the hour, so we are before the seventh seal. But we are at the sixth seal, okay? We are there. And then finally, the seventh trumpet is the same thing. It's the announcement of that the earth has become that, the earth and everything in it has become that of Jesus Christ. So we're not there yet, so we are at the sixth. So prophetically speaking, we're right there. We are right Amen. there. Amen. And Pastor Davis, how close are we to the end of time, my brother? Uh, just based upon the signs that we see happening in our world, it's, it's very clear where we are in a stream of time. And as Pat, Pastor Hector had brought out, looking at certain prophecies in the book of Revelation, we can see where we are presently. And um, even when we look in Daniel chapter 2, uh, we know just looking at that metallic image, we're not in the head, we're not in the, uh, the uh, chest and arms of silver, we're not in the belly and thighs of brass, we're not in the legs of iron, we're in the feet, and we're in the toes. And like somebody, like I always say, we're in the toe jam of time. Toe jam, wow. Literally, with that iron mixed with clay, we're, we're literally there, and the Bible tells us the next thing to happen is that stone cut out of a mountain with our hand that will smite the image at his feet. And we know, um, based upon, um, when you do a close study in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, that that the, the feet mix of iron and clay not only represents a uh, divided Europe, but it also represents a mixture of church and state craft. And we know that before Christ returns, that there will be a union of church and state. Well, can we go to that text in the book of Daniel chapter 2? Let's go to our Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 43. I think that's what it is. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43 in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, wants us to look at um, this verse here, and we want to just continue on with this, and then we can um, start with this um, Bible text, because, you know, there is a great controversy on a macro scale, but this controversy is being played out in the life of every individual that's on the earth today. Why don't you read for us that? Go ahead, my brother. All right, Daniel chapter 2, uh, looking at verse number um, 43. Yes. It says, And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. All right, so because the iron is symbolic of the state power. And the church is symbolic uh, of the clay. The Bible says, I am the potter. The church is the what? The clay. clay. So the mingling of them will be the mingling of church craft and state craft. Let's go to the screen, um, Brother Richard. Uh, we want to show you a statement from um, the Bible Commentary, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 11168. Ellen White says, the mingling of church craft and state craft is represented by the ironing and the clay. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. They'll come together, but it'll be broken. Am I right? right? Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested strength in what, somebody? They have invested strength in, they have invested strength in where? Politics. Politics. And have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law that their evil work will recoil upon themselves. She says that they have gotten themselves involved in politics. And I want to read to you, this is from the Right Ring Watch, and just showing you what's going on. This came out just three days ago, Pastor Q, Pastor Davis. It says that Mike Johnson, who's the new Speaker of the House, who was a Christian nationalist, 
is opening the door for a lot of Christian nationalists to run for office. Do you hear that? And listen to what they say. And so it kind of goes back to what Ellen G. White says. They have involved themselves in politics and look what's going to happen. Mm. A lot of doors are going to be opened up in 2024. Okay. And the climate is ready. Uh, with Mike Johnson getting in now as oh, the yeah. new Speaker of the House. Woo! That that opens up the door. I've talked to some people on the Hill. I'm, I'm going to be up there um, visiting some people. That opens up the door for a lot of new things. Yeah, it does. Uh, not saying that uh, that the other speakers were not, not going to be good like Jordan and some of the others, um, but Mike Johnson being there, is it is prophetic. Uh, him being in that spot, which is going to open the door for a lot of people who wouldn't think to run or run again. It's open that's, now. That's good. Did you hear that? So you see how things are influencing each other, right? You see that? And that Christian nationalism thing is something that we definitely need to take a look at. Now, I want to show you something else from this. Now, look at this. Look what this guy says. Now, listen to this right here. Now, this is what this Christian nationalist said. The biggest difference is going to be applying the word of God to every issue that comes up. We have a constitution that is, by God's grace, it's upholding the word of God predominantly. So we don't have to have them in competition with each other. So as a, as a candidate, the biggest thing that I can bring to the table is we are going to have uh, legislation and we're going to have argumentation from the floor that's based on God's word. And we're bringing a conscience. Did you hear what he said? We're gonna have legislation based on God's word. Mm. And so we know a Sunday law can come out of, will come out of that, right? Mm -hmm. Listen to this. Uh, to a uh, conscience, a moral conscience, I will speak directly as, as uh, 2 Corinthians 4 says, make open statements of the truth to the conscience. That will have such a powerful effect on the votes that are being cast, on uh, the, the kinds of bills that are being passed. So th that is a major issue. And I can't even, we can't even quantify what effect that's going to have right now because we don't know how God will use that. But as, as we kind of go down from there, we want to see morality brought back into government. I want to see uh, pornography abolished. I want to see no fault divorce come back to at fault in divorce uh, and even public shaming for those who are at fault in divorce. I want to see uh, abortion. That's very radical, right? Mm -hmm. Right abolished uh, these are the kinds of morality and government issues that we need to get back to when you think of 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 a of a government practicing righteousness then we have to ask by what standard and the standard is the god who created everything and who uh, will not be thwarted in all of his plans and if we recognize that christ has been seated after, after his resurrection was seated at the right hand of the Father, high above every rule and every authority and every name that is named, and he is now, as Revelation 1 says, the governor, the ruler of all the kings of the earth, then yes, we can rep recognize that a there is a difference between the civil government and the church, but under that, Christ is ruling, and he is king over all. So... Our, we, it's a presuppositional approach to uh, government and and the church, and the presupposition is Christ is Lord. Hmm. All right. So does he sound like he want to take? Does, does he sound like he wants to unite church and stay past the queue? Absolutely, my brother. And uh, what is interesting also is their Messiah. Right. They right. have a Messiah, as you could see here on my screen. Right. And. Currently, the GOP is comparing Donald J. Trump to Jesus. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now, please understand that in Israel, and you heard me correct, in Israel, there is a view that Jesus is a type of a Messiah in line with, um, <clears throat> um, help me out, what was that, uh, lead, the one who opened up the doors? to allow 
Jerusalem, uh, to allow the Greeks in, in, into Babylon. Who was it? Cyrus. Cyrus. He is compared to a type of Cyrus. I'm working on, on uh, jet lag here, so please excuse me. So there are, if you go online, if you Google it, you'll see images of Trump alongside of Cyrus. Jesus, uh, Donald Trump is seen as a type of Cyrus. He, he approved and he supported Israel moving their capital to Jerusalem. You all remember that, right? You all also remember that Trump also moved the embassy right. to Jerusalem. Okay, so he garnered a lot of support. Well, looking at the news, and you can Google it for yourselves, April 4, 2023, Marjorie Taylor Greene compares Trump to Jesus. He is, and not only Jesus, it gets really good. It really does, if you'll allow me. All right, so just going to the third paragraph. You can take it off the screen, Brother Richard. She said Trump joins the ranks of people who have been arrested and persecuted by radical corrupt governments, and it's beginning today in New York City, and I just can't believe it's happening, but I'll always support him. He's done nothing wrong. So this is comparing Donald J. Trump to Nelson Mandela, okay? Nelson Mandela and Jesus Christ, mm. all right? So this is how militant this group is. What do you think about this man's statements? Um, I'm reminded of the statement that you read uh, before playing the video about how this union of church and st church craft and statecraft is corrupting the churches. And I'm thinking about this passage in James chapter 2. Um, it's very interesting when you look at verse 41. It says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. If you notice in, in uh, this verse, it started out being potter's clay. But then as a result of being mingled with the iron, mingled with the state, it became miry clay. So you can see clearly uh, from the scriptures how it lines up with the spirit of prophecy, how it's truly corrupt in the churches. And... Um, there's nothing good that's going to come out of this. There was nothing good that came out of it uh, during the Dark Ages. We can see what happened. And with that history is going to be repeated in these last days. We're told there's going to be a one universal bond and uh, a con universal confederacy. And that under one head, individuals, nations, etc., will unite under the papal power. So... These things are, are happening right before our very eyes. All right, let's go to the screen. We want to read Great Controversy 588. Um, we have it. Um, I know you have it past the queue, so I'm just going to put it on the screen. Let's go to the screen. Now, um, we see right here where Ellen White says the line of, you want to read it? Read it for us. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And notice who? Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping how many? All. All into the ranks of spiritualism. Hmm. Now, observe whom she mentions next. Papists, who boast of miracles who boasts of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. And who? Protestants. Protestants. Notice the three groups that she has, okay? Those that are professed Christians, ungodly, and the papists. Mm. Do you notice that? That is what we have now. These are the three groups that are vying for world power, okay? The Christian nationalists, the secularists, and obviously we can't forget the papacy, okay? Mm. So she mentions all three. And again, will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power and Protestants, whom? Protestants, please read this. Having cast away the shield of truth will 
also be deluded. Mm. Why will they be deceived? Why do they, why are they all falling in line one with another for the same desire, but they don't recognize it? Because it is demonic power taking over since they left the truth. Right. And notice what it says here. Papist, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a what kind of movement? Right. A grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. And we're going to talk about what they're getting ready to talk about now with ecological conversion. Listen to this. Now listen to what another Protestant has said. Look at this. Look at this. Listen to what this Protestant says. Bloomberg came in and put $10 million into my race to his feet. $10 million. I barely have a million dollars of all. He knew all he had to do was throw his money at him and they would defeat him. But what Michael Bloomberg did not realize, Michael Bloomberg was not fighting me. He was not fighting me because God does not choose his people like you. God does choose his people. So that they can prove themselves for it. God chooses his people to prove his grace. And there's only one reason why I won that race. It was the power of God and nothing else. You hear that? So, you know, they're talking like preachers now. Mm -hmm. If you notice that. I thought he was a preacher. You thought he was a preacher. Well, let me tell you this right here. Let me tell you this. I have some news for you. There is a new movement right now called Ecological Sunday Band. And brothers and sisters, Rome, what, what, who did I say? Rome enacts Ecological Sunday driving ban by law to combat climate change. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to read to you from their website right here. Listen to this right here. Now, this is from their website, but you have to put it from Italian to English. And look what it says right here. It says Ecological what, somebody? Sundays. Ecological Sundays, 2023 and 2024. What year are we in right now? And what's our next year? 24. It says, established in the Council Memorandum of September 28th, the scheduled, note on, Ecological Sundays will start again on what day? November 19th. But listen to this. The other maximum Sundays are identified as December 3rd this year, which is tomorrow, January 14th, February, 20, February 25th, and March 24th. Do you notice that these are back-to-back? So listen to this right here. They're doing this to try to combat climate change. The objective for Ecological Sundays is to prevent and contain air what, somebody? Pollution. Contribute to raising awareness among citizens on the issue of air quality and the responsible use of energy sources. And what happens is this right here. They talk about the green belt right here, and they talk about the timetables right here. The first scheduled Ecological Sunday is was November 19th and look at this the next schedule ones December January February and March so what happens is is this right here what what do you think what, what do you think when you see this brother pastor in the light of the something now understand this right here this is just Satan doing groundwork on the rest of the world to get them used to the idea of Sunday sacredness especially wrapping around the idea of climate change because the because though the Sunday market of the beast is based on worship Satan is going to tailor it in different ways to make it palatable for mm -hmm. different people what you want to say take it off the screen brother Richard you just took some of the words right out of my, Go my mouth but it's interesting you look to the to the left their whole thing is climate change but their solution is Sunday. When we looked at the uh, Christian nationalist movement, um, they're coming from a religious angle. Their solution is Sunday. So it all meets at Sunday observance. And I think it's interesting looking at this article right here that they're having this, this, these Sundays set apart uh, monthly, right? But eventually it's going to go from monthly to weekly. Right. What do you want to say about that, Pastor Q? Well, this is exactly what we're looking at, which the spirit of prophecy informed us. Little by little, it will come in incrementally. And as we come to the time of trouble, that is when the full weight of the Sunday legislation 
will be enacted currently within the United States of America and in many other countries around the world. There are Sunday legislations, Western, right. Western countries in the world. There are Sunday types of legislation, days blue laws. Mm -hmm. And please remember that the Supreme Court has already conferred the right of enacting and enforcing blue laws. Tomorrow is Sunday. Right. Okay. Try to go to a try to buy alcohol between before twelve o'clock in the afternoon. See if you're able to do that. You will not be able to do that. You cannot buy alcohol in just about any city in America until after twelve o'clock. And the reason for it is simple. You should be at church. And in one particular church you can get all the alcohol you want for free. Anyway. Wow. So this is very serious. And so the enemy is playing with this. Now what we want to do is we want to show you a video and then what we want to do is kind of comment on it. But let's go to the screen. Let me just show you a couple of things then we're going to go to the video. As you know, COP28 is going on and world leaders, did you know that even on the first day, world leaders agreed at COP28 to fund climate related damages to developing nations as urged by Pope Francis. In Ladato Sea. And what happens is these are things that we can agree on helping other nations, but notice who's pushing the agenda. It is the papacy, it's the Vatican, it's the beast power. And what happens is, is this COP, it says here, um, Catholics at COP 28 vow to carry the Pope's call for action on climate change. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the Pope got sick, he was supposed to come, mm -hmm. but when I heard he got sick, I said I won't be surprised if he doesn't come, and lo and behold, he was not able to come. But listen to this right here, even though the Pope did not come, he sent a message to his ambassador anyway. Yeah. Look at this, Pope Francis to COP28, he says environmental destruction is an offense against God. Hmm. And what will it be said in the last days? Ellen G. White says that it will be declared. She says it will be declared that all these, let me just read it to you in great controversy. The spirit of prophecy says that, oh, no, I'm sorry. Sister White says in great controversy, page, it will be declared that men are offending God, okay, by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. And that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be what? Strictly in force. But the Pope said that environmental destruction is an offense against God. Spirit of prophecy says that it will be declared that uh, men are offending who somebody? Uh, offending God. But the Pope says that environmental destruction is an offense against God. Pastor Davis, what do you think about the correlation between what the Pope said versus what the spirit of, in co correlation with the spirit of prophecy said? What do we, you want to say? We have a prophetess. That's right. Uh, she, she already revealed, you know, these, God revealed it to her that these things will happen, what yes. they will say. And it's, it's happening right before our very eyes. Yes, I'm going to look at that. So, yes, Pastor um, Q, what do you want to say about that? I'd like to read to you an excerpt from the tablet tablet you can find it online it's the sabbath in an era of climate change now the tablet is a jewish publication okay so i want want you to see the synthesis that is happening across all of the monotheistic religions monotheistic they you know not poly many gods people who believe in one give me so the second paragraph which one Where imagine is if here one. it is right, right here there. he's getting ready to read it y'all okay? look at so this so follow along if you can okay but just remember that there is to be a synthesis there is supposed to be a unity okay the bible says in revelation chapter 13 that all the world will worship after the who beast the beast now you're wondering well, how is it possible that Jews, and you should be, Jews, Muslims, and Sikhs, and, and, and Buddhists, and all of these other faiths will worship the beast, which is the papacy? Well, you're looking at it. It's happening. There is a, there is a unity of mind. Revelation 17 says these all have one mind, and they give their power and authority unto who? The beast. Unto the beast. So God has already told us we didn't, we didn't believe in him, but we're starting to see that when God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. So that's enough preamble. Listen, read along if you can. Imagine if most of the world's monotheists, monotheists 
those who come from traditions that profess to observe a weekly Sabbath. These are Jews, mm -hmm. but they recognize that Christians call Sunday the Sabbath. So there is this acceptance along with anyone else who cared to choose for one day out of seven to essentially eliminate their own harm to the environment on a consistent basis. And I'm just going to read the next two sentences. This could prove to be one of the cheapest environmental, environmental solutions at humanity's disposal. In theory, more maximal Shabbat observance could produce a 14.3, that's one-seventh reduction in carbon emission without additional spending, new technologies, or un unintended environmental consequences. One day out of seven where emissions are nearly eliminated. Observing a truly full weekly Shabbat, doing nothing as it were, offers an effective action that one can take now to help heal our environment. God said that all the world would worship the beast. Individual secularists and even within our own church said that's impossible. How are you going to get the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians, and much less everybody else, to agree you're looking at it? That's right. And so let me go to the video, what's going on, because a lot of things are happening now. Now, this is from the UK. It's called King's College of London, a divine catalyst for climate action, the founding of the Faith Pavilion at COP28. So now the religious element is coming into it now. We want to show you a video that just came out last night. Watch this video, because it kind of it goes back to what we're talking about. COP28 is here. Should you even care? Find out today on The Prophetic Eye. I don't know if you heard, but there's some big news coming out of the Vatican. Are you ready? The Pope had the flu. This is a big deal, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But before I do, there's some other important matters that we need to tend to. I want to start today by taking a trip back in time. It was a simpler time. Year was 2009. I had a few less years on me. My son wasn't born yet, so he wasn't there to stress me out. So I had a lot more hair, and I only had pepper hair. No salt at all. Thanks a lot, son. Anyway, this is me preaching in 2009, and this was actually episode four of the original Prophetic Eye series. It was posted on December 4th, 2009, almost exactly 14 years ago to the day, and the episode was called, How's the Weather? It was that year that I saw something emerging. The video's a little grainy and a little less polished, but let's take a look anyway. And so we're seeing changes in the weather. We're seeing more frequent hurricanes, we're seeing more frequent tornadoes, we're seeing the world convulsing. And so the response of the world has been that something's going on. There's global warming, the climate's changing, but what we're going to see is that this is going in a direction that I did not even consider, and everything is lining up to the fulfillment of Revelation 13. Well, you thought there were only seven deadly sins to worry about, but... <laughs> Now, there are more to add to the list. Yes, the Catholic Church has added seven more to the list. Paper or plastic? You could be committing a sin if you choose plastic. A new list of what might be considered modern-day sins has been published in a Vatican newspaper, adding to the original seven deadly sins of lust, gluttony, envy, greed, sloth, wrath, and pride. The additional sins include polluting our environment and are considerably more global in nature and according to the Vatican, aimed at those who might undermine society in far-reaching way. And so this is nothing new. This is a, an excerpt from something that Pope John Paul II spoke about in 1990. And we're going to see that the world is mirroring everything that the papacy has to say. It was all there. The climate change movement, the nations coming together to save the planet, and the previous pope leading the charge. It seems like the more things change, the more they stay the same. But the fact of the matter is that here we are, 14 years later, and they're still having those climate meetings. And there are two trains of thought right now when it comes to prophecy and the climate change movement. The first train of thought is that the climate change movement and its relation to the fulfillment of Revelation 13 and 17 is much ado about nothing. A complete waste of time. And the other train of thought is that the climate change movement is much ado about everything and that it's the radical, ungodly globalists that are going to lead out in passing laws requiring people to worship on Sunday. Well, 
The answer is somewhere in the middle. And if you have the prophetic eye, then you will understand why the climate change movement is not much ado about nothing. And it's not much ado about everything. In actuality, it's much ado about something. And if you hang in there with me today, then you're going to find out why. And remember, you're also going to find out why the Pope's flu is so important. We need to start out by understanding the prophetic framework laid out in Revelation. Now, think about this for a minute. You know, the spirit of prophecy says um, that, and it means we read it to you from the spirit of prophecy. Now, we're going to go back to this video. Now, this is very interesting. Now, listen to this, Ray. We're going to go to Great Controversy, page 565. The servant of the Lord tells us in Great Controversy 565 that uh, the Roman church, she says, is far-reaching in her plans and modes of what, somebody? Operate. She is employing how many devices? So would you say, Pastor Davis and Pastor Q, that by the Pope originally planning to come to COP28 is a part of that plan? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. And it says increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Then it says Catholicism is gaining ground on how many sides? Every side. Can we say that, that they are gaining ground at COP28? Mm -hmm. Yes, so let's go to Great Controversy, page 571. Now on page 571, paragraph one, listen to this right here. It says, now, I want to read this to you. Now, listen to this. In Great Controversy, we're going to look at... Um, Popery. All right, Popery. 571.1. Oh, oh. All right, here it is. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her what, somebody? Purpose. So, with the Pope coming as he has now accomplished more of his agenda than if he came as a fire-breathing dragon? Right. But beneath the variable appearance of the communion, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. So what happens is, it, the, so has Rome changed? No. Will Rome change? No. Now listen to this. Now listen to this. It is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory VII and Innocent III are still the principles of the Catholic Church. And has she but the power, she'll put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. Protestants little know what they are doing when they propose to accept the aid of Rome in the work of Sunday exaltation. While they are bent upon the accomplishment of their purpose, now I want you to look at this right here. Rome is aiming to reestablish her power to recover her lost what somebody? Supremacy. Supremacy. But listen to this. God's word is giving warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and listen to this. Then the Protestant world, which wants to reunite with Rome in Sunday exaltation, will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Now, that tells me that Protestantism does not know what Rome's purpose is. What you want to say? If we could go back to Great Controversy, page 571, paragraph 1. Okay. There is another sentence that she continues on with, this, with, 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 with her point. All right. Popery, it is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. Therefore, please remember, yes. going back to the time of Ellen White, as, as you right. well know, right. the Catholic Church was involved in the suffrage movement mm. and mm. somehow managed to combine the suffrage movement with Sunday. Mm. Then during the Civil Rights Movement, the same thing. Then during... Uh, the abortion discussion and fight before Roe versus Wade, same thing. Always Sunday is always presented. So in no matter what discourse there is on the face of the earth in the United States, in, somehow in some way she manages to push Sunday. And she manages to push Sunday under the veil, under the deceitful tongue of, well, this is just for the ecology this or this is just for the community but notice what the spirit of prophecy says but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon she conceals the in, in, invariable venom of the serpent and then what does she say could you read it let's come on let's read it all together we are not bound to keep faith and promises to who heretics Anyone who is not this coming, I was a Roman Catholic. I wanted to be a Roman Catholic monk out of the order of Franciscan. Mm. Please understand, 
If you are not Catholic, you're a heretic. Mm. Okay? It's the same thing with the Muslims. Okay? They are not bound to tell the truth to anyone who is not a Muslim. Okay? It's the same thing. She, and, but then she goes on. Shall this power whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints be now acknowledged as part of the church of Christ? She works with deceit at a table of lies. That's what Daniel 11 says. Mm -hmm. Okay? The only ones who don't believe that are the secularists. And she takes advantage of that. And she takes advantage of it with everybody else. Look at this right here. Now, listen, what I want you to read this. This is a part that some of us may have not um, forgot, we have forgotten to read. She says, Stephly and unsuspectedly, she is doing what, somebody? Strengthening her forces to further her own ends. Notice this. When the time shall come for her to do what, somebody? Strength. That sounds like a predator, right? Does it sound like a predator? So could it have been that COP28 was the papacy's time, or at least wanted time, to come to strike? Absolutely. It's like a, a rattlesnake or a copperhead, mm. how it blends in with yeah, the leaves. Yeah. And you, if you don't look carefully, you might step to make a wrong step and get bit. Right. That's what it reminds me of when I was reading that statement. I was thinking about that venomous snake that blends in and at the right time it strikes. So could it be possible that God held it back by causing him to get sick so he couldn't come? Absolutely. Even though he spoke, even though he gave a message for COP28, do you believe it's possible, Pastor Q, that God had his hand in the Pope not coming? We, we know for a fact that God is waiting until the number be filled up. He's waiting for his church to be ready. We have a promise from God that God will not allow us to be tempted above what we can handle. Therefore, we should give thanks to God. But it should also be a wake-up call for us. It means we're not ready. God knows we're not ready. And if because we're not ready, we are then, please understand this, we are then consigned to wait longer. And the longer it gets, the worse it is. We cannot say what's keeping him from coming. The answer is simple. It's us. You ain't ready for this. I'm, I'm, I know you all are, and I know all of those watching us online, they're ready for it. Please pray for me. I know I'm not ready for it. Now, pastor, find this Vatican snakehead. Okay? We're talking about the snake. She does not conceal who she is. Me, me, I want you to see what it looks like. Let me show this video, then Go I'll ahead. come to that. Let's show you this right here, and we'll come back to that. Remind me. Sure. 13. Generally speaking, when I mention the prophetic eye, I'm talking about the principles that we laid out in our video, Revelation 13 and 13 minutes. You should check that one out if you haven't already. In that video, we lay out the six principles that will give you the lens to understand everything that's happening in the world, or as I call them, SOS, the six obstacles to Sunday. These six things can help us understand what to look for as we see what's happening in the world. And there's two of these six things that I want to focus on today. Number one, Revelation 13 clearly points to the fact that the Christian world will take the lead in removing liberty of conscience and pass. So it's clear that it's going to be a movement from the bottom up. Amen a Sunday law and number two there will be worldwide cooperation in order to bring this about and how do we know this just take a look at the words I mean really take a look at the words for yourself it talks about a beast or a nation that represents a lamb rep presenting Jesus, the Lamb of God. So obviously, this is a Christian movement. There will be miracles associated with this movement. So clearly, this is religious in nature. In addition to this, we are told that everybody, small, great, rich, poor, free, bond, will be required to receive the mark. That means worldwide cooperation. And in order to have worldwide cooperation, the entire world has to be on board. And this is what it means in Revelation 17, when it says that these have one mind and that they will give their power and strength to the beast. And we know that this beast is the papacy. And this is what we need to understand about the climate change movement. It's not nothing. It's not everything, but it is something. 
It's something that's pulling the world together to be of one mind. And the point is that the papacy is at the forefront of this, and they have been for a very long time. I want you to take a look at this statement from the Great Controversy. It says, the Roman Church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground upon every side. I hope you caught that. Far-reaching, plans, modes of operation, every device to extend influence, to increase power. Catholicism is gaining ground on every side. I don't know. Is it just me, or is this implying that we should pay attention to the work that the papacy is doing in front of the scenes and behind the scenes? But we should do this while keeping in mind that Protestant America will take the lead to cause the world to create a union of church and state. In other words, keep your prophetic eyes on both entities. Be mindful of the movements of the papacy. Pay attention to the movements of Christian nationalism and keep your eyes on the coming together of the nations. And this includes, but is not limited to, keeping your eye on the climate change movement, which now brings me to the Pope's flu. If you didn't hear, the Pope was sick and it was all over the news. And it made the news because he was supposed to go to the COP28 meetings that just started. In this article from The Guardian entitled, Pope Francis Still Unwell After Canceling Trip to COP28, it says, Pope Francis said that he is still not well and entrusted one of his aides to read a prepared speech in his place at the weekly general audience in the Vatican on Wednesday. If you We're going to read to you what that letter said. Don't know. The COP28 meetings are a continuation of plans and modes of operation that have been going on for around 30 years. These meetings have played a major role in fostering a common goal for... Now understand, now is it a good thing to take care of the climate? Yes. It is a good thing to take care of the climate. But a movement, but so we know that Sunday is going to be going to be connected with this. Am I right? So we got to be very careful because the devil's going to try to deceive us into thinking, well, if you don't go along with cleaning up the planet, I mean, if you don't go along with Sunday, then you don't want the planet to be clean. And that's what's going to get a lot of people the nations of the earth to come together to try to save the planet. We covered these modes of operation in our docuseries last year on COP27, and I highly recommend that you take a look at that series to get up to speed if you haven't done so already. And I promise you that it will help you to get the prophetic eye very quickly. Anyway, from Pope John Paul II to Pope Benedict to Pope Francis, for some reason, the papacy has seen a need to insert themselves into, and in some cases, lead out in this movement for decades. And in this same article from The Guardian, we can get a glimpse into why that is. It says, the 86-year-old who has made protecting the environment a cornerstone of his 10-year papacy had planned to become the first pontiff to attend the annual event since they began in 1994. Can we agree that by him attempting to be the first pope would have been coming a little bit more closer to strike? Can we, can we agree with that? Mm -hmm. Listen to this. Five. That's right. This was going to be the first time that a pontiff was going to attend this climate change summit, and it was hindered by the flu. Maybe this is one of the ways that God continues to hold the winds. But back to the article. The article also highlighted that this has been a cornerstone of Pope Francis's 10-year papacy. And I didn't say that. The Guardian did. So, why is this so important to him? Let's read on. With Francis's withdrawal from COP28, which begins on Thursday, the conference will lose a high-profile advocate of the environment, a moral authority on the global stage whose words, some believe, could nudge governments to take concrete action. Why? Let's look at focus of that statement. With Pope Francis' withdrawal from COP28, the conference will lose a high-profile advocate of the environment. What do you think about that statement, Pastor Davis? And then what it says, could nudge governments to take concrete action. Wow. So uh, just like he was saying in the video, um, I truly believe God allowed him to uh, get the flu, to get sick, because even though he still got his you know, message across, right. but it's not the same as being right there in right. person and be able to give that message. So God, 
The Bible is very clear in Daniel chapter 2 that he sets up kings, he puts them down. He's, he's the one in control of all yes. this. And, you know, like the pastor was saying, um, God's people, we're, as God's people, we're, we're not ready uh, for, what's, for what's about to transpire. So God in mercy held it back for us. And I'm going to read this from Evangelism. Keep going. Uh, page 696, paragraph 3. Evangelism, page 696, paragraph 3. It says, we may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. So just like the pastor was saying, we can't blame God. That's right. You know, we have to look at us. It's Go because ahead. of our insubordination that we are still wandering in this wilderness of sin. And we're told that the gospel of the kingdom will be preaching to all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. So he's, right. he's really waiting on us. The stage is set. The stage is, the stage was, is set. But God, for some reason, did not let the Pope come in to exert the influence that the paper, the devil wanted to. What do you want to say, Pastor Q? We need to keep our eyes focused on the end goal of the enemy. That's right. The end goal of the enemy is to receive worship. We know that the Vatican, the, pa the Pope, it's, it's a pawn. Right. He's a pawn of the devil. Okay. We know the United States is a pawn of the devil. We know the ten, the ten powers, okay, these ten kings in Revelation 17. We know they're all pawns because the, devil's, the devil is self-serving. He doesn't even care about the third of the angels that came down with him. Mm. All he wants is to receive what? Worship. Worship. But he doesn't want worship from just a few people. He wants, from all he wants everybody to worship him. Everybody. Notice what he has done. Mm. He has combined the secularists, the humanists, right. people who don't believe in God, people who don't even want to hear the word God. Okay? Yes. They would much rather believe in string theory and other dimensions than first believe in God. Right. Okay? That, that's them. All right? And then we have people who say they do worship God, believe in God, but they don't care about his word as long as God is after his own, their own model. That's okay? Right. So these two groups, what are they interested in? Having a day. Exactly. A day that they control you, us. They can do whatever they want, but they do whatever they can. Once that happens, that's when he comes in. Who's he? That is the Antichrist. That, I mean, that is Satan himself. To come to receive what? Worship. Worship. So, therefore, please observe how everything is coming together. Now, why is God holding it back? Again, we're not ready. May I read Early Writings, page 87? Hold on, let me, let me go there. Early Writings, page 87. Okay? And I hope those of you watching online, please understand that what this is, is a call to awake. Here it is. All right? She, she writes the following, and this is her early writings. Read together. I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of what? Present truth. That's right. People talking about that we shouldn't be focusing on this. Well, then you find another spirit of prophecy. That's right. Okay? You find another book, another red book. I know a, another denomination, they have red books. You can use theirs. All right? Which they will be obliged to to maintain from the scriptures. They must, read please, understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, professing to be beloved friends and relatives, who will what? Declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed. Yeah. Also other unscriptural doctrines. Now, not only do we have a voice coming from within our own church, unfortunately, okay, that wishes to set aside the scriptures, I mean the spirit of prophecy, they also wish to set aside the 28 fundamental beliefs. Well, notice what she's alluding to. We need to be able to explain these 28 fundamental beliefs. Pastor, I'm telling you, in my church, mm -hmm. in Warwick, 
We're going to spend the entire year, members are going to be going nuts right now, we're going to spend the entire year going over our 28 fundamentals. Amen. Praise okay? the Lord. Because of this. Because of this. And finally, they will do all. Are you reading? They will do all in their power to what? Excite, Excite sympathy. sympathy and will work miracles before them to confirm what they declare. Man. The people of God must be what? To withstand what? With the what? Bible truth. How is it possible that we're going to defend the Bible truths when we don't even accept them? Mm. That is why not only the Pope was sick, which is the highlight of COP, yeah. Biden didn't go because Biden can't go. His medication is off. Okay? All right? See, Ping ain't going. Okay? And you know Putin doesn't want to go because if he goes, somebody might try to arrest him, and we will have World War III. Mm. Okay? So observe what God has done. We need to thank God right now that the leaders, that the great powers of the world, the great nuclear powers of the world cannot leave because we have one more year, maybe two, maybe three, I don't know. No one knows the day nor the hour. I'm just saying God said, Jesus said, my people are not ready. That's right. The, pe they, the people of God must be prepared to withstand these spirits with the Bible truth that the dead know not what? And that they who fuss appear to them are the spirits of devils. devils. Our minds must not be taken up with things around us, but must be occupied with the what truth? Present, Present truth and, give in prep and a preparation to give a reason of our hope with meekness and fear. Brothers and sisters, where does that text say that the dead know not anything? Where is that found at? Ecclesiastes. Yes, yeah, let's, let's go to it. These are texts that we need to know. Let's, look, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. We're going to look in the King James Version. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. The Bible says, quote, for the living know that they shall die. We know we're going to die one day, right? Mm -hmm. But in contrast, the dead, those that have already died, know not what? Anything. So how much does a dead person know? Nothing. If they don't know anything, then how is it that they can speak to you? We know anything that contradicts the Bible. We know it's of the devil. Mm -hmm. Also their love, hold on one second, and their hatred and their envy is now what? Perish. Perish. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. These are the texts that we must quote to the spirits. We don't have conversations with them. Do we have a conversation with them? Nope. Do we talk to them? Nope. No. We all the scripture. Got, all the scrolling scripture. What do you want to say, Pastor? Please remember, my brothers and sisters, and those of you watching online, please yes. remember that currently the main, the main, the majority of those who keep the seventh day Sabbath are Jews, number one, and us, number two. Now, but there is a different demarcation. Everybody else keeps another day. What day do they keep? Another day. Okay? Sunday or Friday, whatever it is. Okay? Now, but which denomination, which religion, which faith does not believe that the dead can converse with the living? We are Seven day it. Adventists. We are it. Is it a coincidence? We know from Bible prophecy, we know from Paul himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that there will be, he will, the enemy will appear as an angel of light, and his ministers will also appear as departed loved ones. Mm. We know that he has done it already. We know from the spirit of prophecy that he will do it again. Many religious leaders have passed away. He will, they will impersonate or they will personate those beings. You will see Buddha. You will see Muhammad, okay, the prophet. You will see Mary. Already you're seeing Mary. All of these things will happen for one purpose and one person alone, to coalesce everybody into one faith and to following the beast. That's the bottom line. Look what the beast power said to COP28. This came out 
on December 2nd, 2023. How long ago was December 2nd, 2023? Today. It came out today. Pope Francis today spoke to COP28, called the destruction of the environment an offense against God. I think those are the strongest words that I've heard the Pope speak so far. Ellen White said that it, they will be, it, they said that men are offending God because the Sabbath is being violated. Brothers and sisters, do you see that the Pope is making one step short, coming one step short of what Ellen White predicted will be said? He, Go ahead. Prophecy must be fulfilled. That's right. Prophecy must be fulfilled. Now, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you to also look at what the warning we have received from the spirit of prophecy. Please, those of you watching online, go from here to eternity, page 370. What's in Great Controversy 606? Okay. Also found in Great Controversy page? 608, I'm sorry. 608, okay. As the... To and okay. Hold on one second. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, here it there is. There it is. As the storm approaches, a large class who have what? Professed. Faith. In the what? Third angel's message. Are those Catholics? No. Those are are those Pentecostals? No. Are those Lutherans? Who are they? Seventh-day Adventists. But have not been what? Sanctified. Through? Obedience to the truth. What do they do? Abandon their position. And? By uniting? With the world. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and they choose the easy. popular side, okay, the easy side. Men who once rejoiced in the truth, God help me, employ their talents and pleasing address to mislead souls. They become bitter enemies of their former brethren. These apostates are efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse Sabbath keepers and stir up the rulers against them. Mercy. Mm. Wow. Mm. You see that? This is why, brothers and sisters, with those of us who are already in the faith, we need to be sanctified by obedience to the truth. That's the bottom We line. need to get out there and we need to warn the world and we need to teach the world what Pastor Ola, Dr. Olatunji is doing, what my brother is doing. We need to do that. We need to do that in a loving and caring way, understanding that for them, this is brand new. They don't see this. Of course not, as our brother says, who's recorded. They don't have the eye of prophecy. They don't understand right. prophecy. They don't see that. But we do, and we teach them, and we learn these prophecies, and we master them, and then we share them with other people, my brothers and sisters. And look at this. The keynote address that the Pope had intended to give in person at the COP28 conference was distributed to the attendees in Dubai, where the Vatican Secretary of State read, notice this, what kind of version? So what the Pope really was going to say, it had to have been shortened of the Pope's speech on the assembly. The Pope, who turns 87 in two weeks, canceled his scheduled trip to the United Arab Emirates days before the climate summit at the request of his doctors after coming down with the flu infection that left him breathe with deep breathing difficulties and acute bronchitis. Mm. Sadly, I am unable to be present with you as I had greatly desired, the Pope said in this message. Then it says, even so, I am with you, have mercy, because mm. the destruction and environment is a what? Offense against God. And then what's now? A sin. Hold on now. Hold on now. He says the destruction of the rhyme is not only offense against God, but it is a what? Sin. And brothers and sisters, you know what it's called? Ecocide. Ecocide is the destruction of the natural environment. Ecocide. So what he's saying is you, you, suicide means you kill yourself. Homicide is that you kill somebody else. Infanticide, infant, infanticide is when you kill a child. Ecocide is when you kill the environment. So brothers and sisters, and guess what? They do have ecocide laws to where, brothers and sisters, they are trying to put people in jail for. Listen to this. Look what the Pope said. Pope Francis repeats the call for the inclusion of ecocide as a fifth crime against peace when they shall say peace 
and safety, right? Pope Francis repeats for the include call, repeats call for the inclusion of ecocide as a fifth crime against peace. Brothers and sisters, if you don't worship on Sunday, they're going to say that you're committing ecocide. Wow. And you also have to understand that for it's the over. Catholic Church, it's over. The earth, okay? The earth, the environment it's is over. a deity. Okay? You worship the earth, okay? Is Mother Earth a Catholic concept? And the answer is yes. The Holy, uh, and according to it, they use the Apocrypha. The what? Apocrypha. Apocrypha, not the Bible, okay? Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, 40 verse 1. Okay, great labor is created for all men, and heavy yoke is upon the children of Adam from the day of their coming out of their mother's womb until the day of their burial into the mother of all. They accept the Apocrypha, and because they accept the Apocrypha, they see the earth as a god in and of itself. Okay, those who believe that the Catholic Church is not a polythe, the people don't know. The Catholic Church is a polytheistic faith. It's, it's, it's not a monotheistic faith. It's a polytheistic faith. They also, worship the, they also worship Mary. Okay? Now, why is all of this important? Because they have confused the, the people of the earth. They actually believe that this guy's Christian. They're not. Okay? They're not. They're not as much Christian as Jehovah's Witnesses are or Mormons are. And I probably just got you banned again. Okay. <laughs> all right. So all of this is to demonstrate, my brothers and sisters, that people are confused. That's right. They They're don't confused. know what they even believe now. And what is sad is that Seventh-day Adventists are following in that group. Man, look at this right here. Pastor Davis, it says, Pope Francis says, destroying the earth is a what? Sin. Sin. And should be a what? Crime. And if it's a crime, you can go to where for it? Jail. But depending upon some crimes, you go to jail. Some crimes you get put to what? Death. Death. Revelation 13 says, if you don't worship the beast, you should be what? Killed. Killed. So it will be a, cla it will be a high class felony to not worship on Sunday. Mm. And can you see how Sunday rest can fall into ecocide? Yeah, absolutely. Why would, why would Sunday breaking, why would Sunday breaking be considered ecocide in the last days? It's interesting in Revelation chapter 13. Yeah. Um, in Revelation chapter 13, we read, um, let me see here, verse number, let's see, Revelation 13. Verse 15. I believe it's verse 15. Go ahead. Let me see. Revelation 13. We're going to turn to Revelation 13 for the, our viewing audience. And brothers and sisters, we still got some more stuff to go. And we want to let you know that we verse have 12. a Zoom meeting tonight at 730 to do part two of this. Go ahead. What, what verse? Verse 12. But I'll start at verse 11. Yes. Go ahead. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. We know that's dealing with the United States, Protestant America. Right. Verse 12, and he exercised all the power of the first beast, the papacy, before him, and caused us the earth, no, the earth, and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So I, I can definitely see ecocide falling into this because, uh, just like the Bible says, he calls us the earth. And them that dwell therein. So I can, I can see them saying, look, um, you're not keeping Sunday. You're mm -hmm. committing ecocide. You're, exactly. You're, you're, you're the reason why we're uh, in this climate change uh, crisis. Uh, so okay, hold on. Hold on, it could on. end up individuals being put to death or even uh, jail. As a matter of fact, you look at the old, uh, some of the old uh, blue laws. I was reading something in a particular book. And in the book, it was revealed, it was, it was going through different um, states, and they had right. certain laws. Right. And some that said you had to pay this fine, some that said you could go to jail, and then they said even death in some of them. Uh, and this was earlier on when it, before actually America uh, became an a independent nation. This was just during the time of the colonies right. this book was bringing out. So we can most definitely see um, 
this coming into fruition in the near future. Now notice this, in this text right here, as you see, you see two entities. You see the Bible says, it causes the earth mm -hmm. and them. So according to this verse, do we see one or two entities? Two. The earth and them which dwell therein to do what, somebody? Worship. So who worships? The earth, them, or both? Both. So them that dwell therein, that's a human beings. Am I right, somebody? But how does the earth worship? The earth worships by keeping the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And keeping the Sabbath is an act of worship. Mm -hmm. So what we see right here, we see that there will be legend. It says, and cause of the earth. How do you cause? You have to make it a law. Mm -hmm. So this verse right here, inherently, exegetically explained, shows how Sunday laws will be enforced nationwide and worldwide mm -hmm. to worship the beast because it's not the beast it's not god's sabbath it is the beast sabbath which is sunday and not sabbath go ahead my brother one of the things that we need to address take it off the screen brother richard one please. of the things that we need to address is why linking sunday to the ecology and the answer is very simple in order to pass the supreme court did you hear me in order to what past the Supreme Court. See, the Supreme Court has determined that there are religious laws that also have what? Secular benefit. It is a benefit for you not to be able to buy alcohol on Sunday during the hours of whatever till 12 a.m. to 12 p.m., okay? It, it'll decrease the amount of traffic, accidents, and everything else like that. And it, it's generally good for the environment. It's all right to also close certain businesses on Sunday in order also to promote the, uh, the community. So therefore, a dr mixing Sunday with the ecology or with the environment right. passes that muster, mm -hmm. allows the government and allows the law, the, the judges, legal legway in where to say, okay, we're going to allow this to happen. Right. But there has to be a consensus. What day? What day? So we already know what day it's going to be. Sunday. There you go. And just to go add ahead. to uh, what the pastor was saying there, um, when you look at the Supreme Court, who's the majority in the Supreme Court? Catholic. So there you go. There it is. And so let's look at this right here. So let's go back to the screen right here. Brother Rich, let's go back to the screen. It says, Pope Francis says, destroying the earth is a sin and should be a crime. Addressing the International Association of Penal Law in the Vatican. On November 15, 2019, Pope Francis is proposed. Who proposed it? The papacy. That sins against the what? Which would be sun, which would be which will fall under Sunday breaking, be added to the teachings of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and went a step further, saying the ego side should be a fifth category of crimes against what somebody, when they shall say peace and safety. Do you understand this? So now we can see how that this ecological thing is involved in the peace movement. At what level, somebody? The international level. Do you understand this right here? This is a fifth category of crimes against peace which should be recognized by such by the war international community. In other words, ecocide is just harming the environment. We know where this is headed to. But listen to this right here. He says, it is a sin that is not only personal, but also what's about it? Structural. One that greatly endangers all human beings, especially the most vulnerable in our midst and threatens to unleash a conflict between generations. And they go through what he has been doing and all that stuff. Then it says in his message at COP28 conference, the Pope underlined the need for multilateralism. What is multilateralism in the short, brother? World power. It's over. It's over. Look at that. He underlines the need really for everybody to come together as one, the whole world. And it says, and establish global, what? What kind of rule? Global and effective rules to fight climate change. What do you want to say about that, Pastor? 
you know, I was, I was still chewing on that last one we was looking wow. at right there. Um, instead of coming right out and saying what what they really trying to do, right. they use these these key words, right. you know, to try to mask, you know, what yes. they're really trying to do. But if you read carefully, the next one it says global and effective rules, meaning they want the various governments to to be able to enforce, have these laws in place to uh, bring this about. And according to prophecy, Pastor Sean Davis, what law most likely? will be a global and effective rule to fight climate change according to the spirit of prophecy. Sunday observance. Sunday worship. See, just because they said, it doesn't mean that we don't know what's going to be said. The thing about beauty about prophecy is we're able to see beyond the statements. Mm -hmm. Look what it says right here. Climate change signals the need, listen to this, for political change. You hear that? Let us emerge. Ooh, now, it's Political not a government. Change. It's a pope of religious power saying this. Let us emerge from the narrowness of self-interest and nationalism. Mm. These are approaches belonging to the past. Then it says the pope called it disturbing that global warming has been accompanied by a general cooling of multilateralism, a growing lack of trust within the international community. In other words, look, we can't water this thing down. We got to bring this thing back together. How much energy is humanity wasting on numerous wars? Conflicts that will not solve problems will only increase them. Mm -hmm. And then he says here, let us join. What? Let who? Us, us join in embracing an alternative vision. What kind of vision? Who's given this vision? The Pope. Brother Phil, you see that? This will help. Uh-oh. Watch this right here. Here it comes. Let us join in embracing an alternative vision. This will help to bring about an ecological, ecological conversion. conversion. Hold it. Uh-oh. You know where I'm, some of you know where I'm going to go to. He says, this, oh, come on. Oh, man, this thing ain't working. This, let us join together. Now, I'm going to show you this, Pastor Q. I'm going to show you something. Let us join in embracing an alternative vision. Who's given the vision? The Pope. The Pope. For this will bring about a what kind of conversion? Ecological conversion. And listen, I told you. I've been trying to tell people, people think we're just lying, but listen to this, times of Malta. Look what the Catholic Church said in 2015. Sunday should be a day of what? Rest, but that's what they say. But listen to this right here, times of Malta, where they talk about ecological conversion. Listen to this right here, ecological conversion. And that's in Laudato Si. And, and in Laudato Si, they talk about the need to keep Sunday. Brothers and sisters, this is very prophetic. Listen to this right here. Uh, look at this. At the structural level, hold on now, ecological conversion. See, the Pope is pushing for ecological conversion, moving away from the exclusively profit-oriented economy towards common good. common good, social common good, and human flourishing. But let me just get to the bottom line. All right, this is what it says right here. And then after he says structural, notice this. In this article, he said structural. But let's look at this right here. Ecological conversion also means we're dealing with time differently, both as an individual and as a society. We need to rediscover the rhythm of time, the alternation between work and rest with Sunday as the commonly shared day of rest. And the Pope says this will help bring about an ecological what? Conversion. I'm here to tell you the Pope wants a Sunday law. Mm -hmm. He can't pass it. For, he can't pass it. It has to be the United States. But the Pope very knows. The, he, he may not even know, mm -hmm. but Satan knows. Am I right? The Pope wants a Sunday law. Hmm. Hold on now. In this regard, I will assure you of the commitment and the support of one church called the what, somebody? Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, which is deeply engaged in the work of what? Education. I don't want them teaching me anything. And encouraging participation by who? All. Oh. As well as promoting what kind of lifestyles? Sound. Mm. Since all are responsible to the contribution, which is fundamental. Brothers and sisters, not only is the Pope, was the Pope supposed to do it, his right-hand man will also preside over the inauguration of the interfaith pavilion. 
tomorrow. Mm. Brothers and sisters, this faith pavilion hosted by who? Brother Pastor Davis? The Muslim Council of Elders. Two can't walk together so they be agreed. Will serve as a hub for faith. It's over, y'all. It's over. You can read the rest of it. It's over. Do you see that? The Pope wants an... Let me go back to it. He said, this is what the Pope said, join us in embracing a what kind of vision? This will help bring about an ecological conversion. An ecological conversion means what, somebody? Sunday. Sunday is the commonly shared day of rest. I know I got some detractors, and I'm not, I don't care what they say. The bottom line is Pope Francis wants a Sunday law. We can read in between the lines. Am I right, Brother Larry? Ho, 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 Go ho, ahead. Ho, hold on. Take it off the screen, brother. There, Go ahead. There is no it's need over. to read between the lines. It's over. There it's is over. no need to read between the lines. It's over. That's what they want. It's over. That's what they it's want. Over. And it's not he, it's they. Dang. It's their it's policy. Yes. This is their stated goal. It's over. This is their stated objective. It's over. Okay? If you read any one of the encyclicals of any one of the prior popes, you will see that this has always been their goal. There is no reading between the lines when it comes to this. Okay? Those who say that we are reading between the lines, they're either blind or disingenuous. That's it. Okay? That's, that, that's all there is to it. The Bible himself says, God himself says, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Okay? And to overcome them. And power was given him over all. Where is the Pope's representative right now? Where? Where? What, what, what nation? What nation? Huh? The, at this cop thing. Where? Huh? In, do, in where? Say it loud. Say it loud so that way they can hear you online. Dubai. Right. Is Dubai Christian or Muslim? Muslim. It's over. Mm. Over every kindred, nation. He's in Dubai. That's right. He's in Dubai telling Dubai what to do. Mm. And by the way, how does Dubai make their money? Oil. Over solar power? <laughs> over, sun, over wind power? It's big, man. How do they make their money? It's over. Oil. It's and he's telling them they got to shut it down. Mm. Yeah, are you, you, it's over. We, we don't, we're not seeing what is being done. He's telling an oil rich producing group of people who do not worship him, who do not believe in him, who do not follow him, that they got to fall in line. That's, right. That's what he's doing. And the Bible says it, and we're seeing it. But we don't want to believe it. We want to believe that we got more time. Folks, the longer it takes, the worse it gets. That's right. Okay? Better for us that this happens this year. Because the last movements could be rapid. It's going to be Okay? Rapid. It's going to be fast. But the longer it takes, the more angrier they get. And they're going to take it out on somebody. Don't believe me? Look at what happened to the they're Muslims. They're going to take it out on who? Who are they going to take it out on? Hey, let's, let's read it right hold on, here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you read that, uh -huh. before you read Come that, on. they're going to take it out on us, right? On us. Who else is that? Now, we're going to connect the eco side thing. Yes. With our, it's last day events. What page? Last day events, page 149. Now, what happens is understand this right here. You always wondered why would... Things be so, what would cause this thing to be so extreme to where if you didn't worship on Sunday, they'll put you to death and put you in jail. Brothers and sisters, you are seeing the scroll unroll with all this climate change stuff. Now, where, 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 where do we start at? As the defenders. Okay. Let's go to the screen, Brother Richard. Let's go to the screen. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some will be thrust where, somebody? Some of us are going to go to jail. Some will be what? And listen to this. Some will be treated as what? 
slaves. Mm. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible. But as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Look at the Holocaust. Look at Rwanda. Mm. Overnight, you saw mass genocide. In Rwanda, they said on the radio, them people from that tribe, they're nothing but cockroaches. Mm. They called them cockroaches. When you think of a cockroach, you think of only one thing to do, kill it. Am I right, somebody? And that, that kind of rhetoric, those seven-day Adventists, listen to this right here. Hold on for a second. Listen to this. I want to read to you from Testimonies to Ministers, page 37. Listen to what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Ellen G. White says in the Spirit of Prophecy. Listen to this right here. Um, it is in the Spirit of Prophecy. I want to read this to you. That's why we got to read these things because it says, listen to this. Satanic agency, agencies have been moved from where somebody? Beneath. Beneath. And have been inspired, have inspired men to unite in a confederacy of evil that they may perplex, harass, and cause the people of God great, great distress. Then it says the whole world is to be stirred with enmity against who somebody? Seven day event. Seven day event because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday the institution of this Christian anti-Christian power. Ellen G. White says, it is the purpose of Satan to cause them, who is them? Seven-day seven Adventists to be blotted from the earth. You see why Satan hates the Seven-day Adventist church? You see why he is making war against Seven-day Adventism? Working you see from why he's working from within, bringing Jesuits, Adventist Jesuits, demons in human form, false brethren and stuff? Because Satan wants seven day Adventists to be blotted from the earth in order that is supremacy of the world. You see why important it is may not be disputed. So we're standing in the way. We're standing in the and we're standing in the devil's way. And mm. also our numbers are diminishing. Those of us who are preaching the present truth are diminishing. <sighs> when you have professors in our institutions undermining the present truth. That's right. Okay? Calling us, calling us all types of things. Yeah. All right? And then also ridiculing us for warning the people. Last time I checked, the Bible said in Ezekiel chapter 9, okay, go and put a mark on those who sigh and cry over the abominations happening. You can take it off the, the screen. Church. Not those who are ignoring it. One thing I need to bring up to you. One thing, I'm, I'm sorry, Doc, please forgive me. I, 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 I'm going to take a poll right now. Before you all leave, before you leave, just, just everybody and those watching online, I want you to put down, yes or no, has slavery been abolished in the United States of America? If you believe yes, raise your hand. Have slavery been abolished in the United States of America? Raise your hand if you believe yes. Just raise it. Don't be afraid. Okay. How, and those watching online, just put yes. Those watching online and those here, how many of you say no? Those watching online. All right. Most of you then no. Notice what the 13th Amendment actually says. Neither slavery nor involuntary service Except, what was that word? Except. Except as a punishment for crime. For what? Crime. What type of crime? They don't specify. Mm -hmm. It could be any crime. Okay? Whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So if you believe that slavery was abolished in the 13th Amendment, y'all drinking the Kool-Aid. And yes, didn't we ahead. read in the Spirit of Prophecy where it's, she mentioned that slavery would rise again? In Revelation says it. Yeah. And may, may, maybe we need to read it. Can we, can we read about slavery? Mm-hmm. 
Can we read about slavery? Because yeah. I want to read this Last to you. Last day events. Yes, listen to this right here. I want to read this to you about slavery. Um, and we want to read this to you in the spirit of prophecy. And this is why we can't keep our, our, our eyes shut on this. Uh, I want to read this to you. Uh, spirit, okay. Hold on. I want you to listen to this. Listen to this right here. Now, Ellen White, you know, um, said something under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go, let's go to the screen, Brother Richard. Listen to this right oh here. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Ellen G. White says, slavery will be revived again. Where? In the South. Why? For the spirit of slavery still lives. And it will not do for the whites who labor for colored people to take their stand as firmly and boldly and openly as they would be free to do so were they in other places. This in this right here, this is very deep. If they feel they have the right and the sanction of those who have brought them the truth, some of the colored people will take the, the opportunity to, de to defy their oppressors. And when you read what Ellen White talked about in the South, I mean, it was very bad in the South. And I'm going to read to you something. Now. I just want to read this to you now because I know this, this may ruffle some feathers here, but it's the truth. It's all the truth. The Southern work. Oh, come on. Southern work. Page 85. I'm going to read this to you. Oh, the Southern work. Let me just write this down. The Southern work. All right, I want to read this to you from the Southern Work, page 85. Let me see if I can find this. And this is talking about the Oakwood Industrial School. Praise God for Oakwood. But listen to this right here. I want to read this to you, what Ellen White talked about, what's going on in the South. Why does she say this right here? Ellen White says, quote, well, because she said, the, okay, it says, I got to read this to you. Oh, come on now. Got to find it, got to find it. All right, here it is right here. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. Now, this is deep right here. Now, this is when the South was super racist. Do you understand it? What kind of racist? Super. Super racist. You know what I'm talking about. Um, this is what Ellen G. White said. Here it is right here. It says, it is from, now, it says here, she, back then she said, then there will be, okay. She says, it is from the who? Whites. Whites. That the greatest, this is LNG White not me saying this, that the greatest opposition may be expected in the South. This is the quarter which we would need to watch. The white people are prejudiced against the doctrines taught by the Seven Day Adventists. Hmm. And a religious opposition is the greatest difficulty. The white people will stir up the blacks by telling them all kinds of stories. And the blacks who can lie even when it's for their interest to speak for the truth will stir up the whites with falsehoods and the whites who want occasion to seize upon any pretext for taking revenge, even upon those of their own, what somebody? Who are presenting the truth. This is the danger. As far as possible, everything that will stir up the race prejudice of the white people should be avoided. At that time, she was saying, there is danger of closing the door so that our white laborers will not be able to work in some places in the South. Now listen to this right here. I got to read this to you. Uh, oh, come on. Maybe God don't want me to read it because some, some people may not be able to handle what I'm going to read. Mm. Are, are you ready for this? I don't know because some people, oh, here it is right here. All right, here it is. As you say, there's no more fruitful field in the South. It is the prejudice of the white against the black race that makes this feel very, very hard. The whites, not all whites, but she said that there who have oppressed the colored people still have the same what somebody spirit. spirit which you saw in Jackson Mississippi in February when they were trying to pass that apartheid bill to put the power in the whites in Jackson which is 80% black these people were not around when slavery was around but they they were passing that law like it was 1883 listen to this they did not lose it all that they were conquered in war they are determined to make it appear that the blacks, I'm reading to you why she said the spirit of slavery still is. They are determined to make it appear that the blacks were better off in slavery since they were set free. Mm. Any provocation from the blacks is met with the greatest cruelty. The field is one that needs to be worked with the greatest, what somebody? Discretion. Discretion. You got to be very careful, even in the South still. Mm -hmm. any, now, this is back then. Any mingling of the white people with the colored people, as in sleeping where? Or showing them friendship as, that's how bad it was, mm. as showing friendship as will be shown by whites to those of their own color is exasperating to the white people of the South. Mm. Yet the same persons employ what kind of women? 
colored women. That was the old school term for black. To nurse their children and further, not a few white men, that means many of them, have had children by colored women. Thus, the colored people have been received an education from the whites in immorality. And many of them stand ready to treat the whites as the whites have treated them. Everything from black power to the white man, to certain white black power movements, and that the white man is the devil and we hate white people, that same spirit still lives today. But that does not live at state line, amen, because we love everybody, amen. And many of them stand ready to treat the whites as the whites have treated them. Then Ellen White says, the relation of the two races has been a matter of what? Hard to deal with, and I fear that it will ever remain a most perplexing problem. Mm. This is why slavery will be revived back, because the sins of the father have been handed down to the third and fourth generation. Am I right, somebody? And how many generations from slavery? We're in the fourth. If a generation is 40 years, you got white people today, not all whites. Thank God for you, Brother Phil. I know you ain't got a racist bone in your body. But let me tell you this, Ray, you got a lot of whites who are thinking just like their great, great, great grandfather who was a slave master. Mm. But thank God there's many white people that love black people like they're their brother. Amen. But what happens is in this country, which is still systemically racist, brothers and sisters, the thing, and I'm going to say this to you, take, take it off the screen. Brothers and sisters, racism has taken a different form now. Back then it was with the whip and stuff, calling you boy and stuff like that. But brothers and sisters, you know what the new racism is being um, manifested in now? It's a thing called gentrification. And red line and all these places. I am from D.C. And D.C., anybody from the DMV knows that D.C. was known, once always known as Chocolate City. Brothers and sisters, it is getting vanilla now. No, you put vanilla in it and you think it's a combination. There are places where it was the hood hood. Harlem is getting gentrified. Brooklyn, everywhere where there was blacks. Detroit, I mean the hood, they're getting Atlanta, anywhere. You could just name it. What happens is this is nothing more than systemic racism. What do you do? You jack up the prices mm -hmm. and make it unaffordable to blacks, and the blacks have to move out. Mm -hmm. That's racism, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. See, racism isn't just hating somebody because a black person can be a bigot, you hear me? Mm -hmm. And if a black man hates white people, He's not of God. Do you understand this? Hold on one second. He's not of God. Am I right? If a black man, because what happens is this. Jesus says, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Do good to them that would despitefully use you. Jesus tells us in the Bible how to overcome racism. You got to deal with hate, with love. And I know that's hard for us as people of color because the natural reaction is what Malcolm X said. If that white man pitched on you, you send him to the cemetery. We don't do that. Mm. Hold on one second. But what happens is, what did Martin Luther King do? He embodied the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did he do? Passive resistance. And when they came at him with the hoses, with the dogs, they didn't retaliate. And you know what that did? God allowed the civil rights movement, and thank God for our white brothers and our white sisters. Some lost their lives. Thank God for the abolitionists, though our white brothers and sisters, don't forget, there were plenty of white people that did not agree with it. And they fought for the freedom of black people. Do you understand this? And Ellen G. White herself stood up for the black people in the Adventist church and this nation. That's why Oakwood got started. And that's why in her will, her real will, she said the royalties of my books were to go to support the black work. So when I talk about this, I got to present it from a balanced standpoint. But we're seeing structural racism being played out in a new different form mm -hmm. to segregate the whites from the blacks. So when Sister White says that slavery will come back again in the South, everything I'm seeing from gentrification, and trust me, all these new developments you see in Carlson, all of that ain't for us. Mm -mm. That's not for black, that's for somebody else, people who got the money, am I right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is this right here. You know what Jesus says? Turn the other what? Cheap. They want to kick us out of the cities. We need to get out the city anyway. Mm -hmm. Let them have them. Amen? Because for some of these races, 
that's going to be the only heaven that some of them ever going to have. Mm. But if anybody's connected to God, Ellen G. White says, you are far above race. Otherwise, you don't look at race. A white man don't look at a black person, and a black man don't hold harbor and hatred to the whites, even though they may have the human right to do it, because we're converted. Amen? Amen. What you want to say, brother? I'm sorry. I didn't want to get into that. No, no. But we see the spirit of racism coming back. Now, does that mean you shouldn't move to the south? Man, as long as I'm from D.C. D.C. is the south. I'm not going up north. It's too cold. Unless the Lord tell me to. I love it in the south. It's nice, that warm, and I love that southern hospitality. Yeah. Amen. But the time is going to come. But see, God is showing us that nowhere in this world, whether it's the south or any city in the north, no place on planet earth is safe. But the only safe city to be in is New Jerusalem. Amen. What you want to say, Pastor? Amen. I'm thinking about, as we was talking about this, I was thinking about the parable of the Good Samaritan and how Jesus in that parable uh, dealt with th these issues that we even see today. Um, and I remember reading this parable. When you look at it, at the end, he said, which one of these was neighbor to the one who fell among these? That's he asked right. that lawyer that. And the lawyer can't even say Samaritan. He said, the one who showed mercy on him. He couldn't even say Samaritan. And, and that shows you that even uh, back then there was uh, racism. Right. Uh, Jews between the Samaritans. And the Jews were racist as well, too. Right. So what happens is racism is not a white thing or a black thing. That's a sin problem. Am I sin right, problem. somebody? Yes, sister. Eight hundred thousand, I think it was eight hundred thousand dollars for a house some years ago, a brand yeah. new house. Now, fast forward, they want to sell it, but no one in Atlanta will buy it, especially a white, because what they have done with the monies, as far as a, almost a million dollar home, they let them buy it. But now that they want to sell it, after 10 or 15 years in it, they won't, no one would even bother to look at it to buy it. They don't want to buy from blacks. Yeah. And that's another way to keep them down or to get them to leave the area so that they can take it over. All right, so go ahead, Pastor. Another way to keep us down to keep and please understand that when I'm saying us it means anyone who is outside of a certain economic level okay please understand that because if you have the money then you can do things but if you don't have the money the whole purpose now with this uh, cop tw all of this economic stuff all of this environmental stuff is also to transform from capitalism to socialism and the importance of socialism is it keeps everybody frozen in their state until they can't afford it and they drop down, yes. making a greater gap between the haves and, and the have-nots. Have there is no middle income. There is no middle income group. There will only be rich and everybody else. That's right. Rich and poor. Okay. That's all there's going to be. Now, does the spirit of prophecy warn us about this? Yes. Yeah. Where is it? It's in the chapter in Great Controversy called the French Revolution. And she states in the Great Controversy that the same thing that led to the French Revolution will be what? Repeated. There was a vast difference between those who had and those who didn't. Okay? And those who didn't eventually rebelled against the Catholic Church, who was the one in power, and also the aristocracy. Okay? And then they removed it. Well, now it's going to happen in reverse. Because those who are wealthy have been, will accumulate everything. I don't say this. The Spirit of Prophecy says this. Follow along with me, please. I'm going to find you the quote. Uh, notice what she says, um, okay, um, let me see, give me a second, give me a second, I, I, I used this at uh, the church that I, ha that I was at, uh, which church was that, Pastor? Warwick. 
No, 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 no. The, your South Huntsville. Uh, South Huntsville. Okay. All right. Uh, I can't. I can't find it. Um, I can't find it now. I'll find it in a few minutes. But anyway, the point of the matter is that that is going to be repeated again. What happened in the French Revolution will be repeated, except that instead of removing the papacy, we will put the papacy in place because the papacy purports to be in favor of who? Of the, uh, of the poor. Okay, here it is. August 13th, 1899, manuscript release number five, page 305. Manuscript release number five, page 305, August 13th, 1899. Read along with me. In India, China, Russia, and the cities of America. Let's go to the screen. Read it one more time. Okay. In India, China, Let's Russia. Let's go to the screen, Brother Richard. Okay. There go we ahead. go. In India, China, Russia. 1899, she's writing about India, right. China, and who else? Russia. Were they three any type of world power in 1899? Were they? No. India, China, Russia were nothing. Are they something now, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, remember that. And the cities of? What's happening? Thousands of men and women are what? Dying of starvation. And then what does she write? The moneyed men, because they have the power, control the, they purchase at low rates, all they can obtain, and then sell at greatly increased prices. This means what? Starvation to the poorer classes, and will result in a civil war. There will be a time of trouble mm. such as never was since there was a nation. I had one detractor, one individual, God bless him, I know he meant well. He said, Pastor, you're taking this out of context because this was speaking about the past. I said, Brother, what's that last sentence that she writes? There will be a time of trouble. That's in the future. That's not present and it's not history. There will be a time of trouble, such as? Never was. That's coming. This is future. Let's, fin let's finish this video. And there it is, more and more, the climate change movement being recognized as a moral issue. And as the article stated, the Pope is being recognized as the quote, moral authority to nudge the governments to take action. Or in other words, they are using far reaching plans, modes of operation, and every device to extend their influence. The groundwork for this has been laid for years. By making this a moral issue, the papacy has positioned themselves to be that moral leader. This is why in Pope Benedict's encyclical letter, he stated that there was an urgent need of a true world political authority. He stated that the concept of the family of nations needs to acquire real teeth. This is what you need to understand. In the world that we live in, there are Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, atheists, Buddhists. The list goes on and on. And the papacy will work in whatever capacity they can to bring all these people together under their moral authority in an attempt to undo all that Protestantism has done. And this influence is paying off. And I want you to see it by taking a look at this other first that's happening at COP28 right now as it relates to the religious community coming together and the moral implications of the climate change movement. In this article from the United Nations Environment Program website, it talks about the importance of faith-based engagement at COP28. It says, faith-based organizations and religious leaders are an important presence at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties, demonstrating that religious and spiritual communities are essential to fight against climate change and to achieve the sustainability development goals and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Here's another one from the National Catholic Reporter entitled COP28 to have first ever faith pavilion at the UN Climate Summit. 
It says, Pope Francis is set to speak at the inauguration of the first ever faith pavilion during the upcoming 28th United Nations Climate Change Conference in the United Arab Emirates. As political leaders from across the globe gather from November 30th to December 12th to assess how well they are addressing climate change, religious officials, including Francis, who was both a head of state and the leader of the worldwide Catholic Church, will have a new place of prominence. Did you hear that? A new place of prominence. Did you catch it? He's a prominent leader of the church, and he's also a prominent leader of the state. Now, of course, we know he didn't go because he had the flu. But look at that. Religious officials have a new place of prominence, and they established a faith pavilion there. It seems to me that the religious are taking the climate change baton, and they're getting ready to run with it. When we add this to the reality laid out in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 that talks about the increasing natural disasters as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, what we have here is a recipe for worldwide influence that will clearly play a major role in end time prophecy. The prophet John foresaw the worldwide issues at the end of time. He saw the calls for the so-called family of nations to be formed, and he was given messages by Jesus himself to counteract this work. This is why you see it over and over again in the book of Revelation. Every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Those terms are found in Revelation 5, 7, 10, 11, 13, 14, 17, 18. Are you seeing a pattern here? I think God is trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us that there is a message that needs to get to all the races, all the religions, all the people he has died for. And it's a message that will counteract the plan and modes of operation of the papacy. As I mentioned in a recent episode of The Prophetic Eye covering Laudate Diem, the current Pope has continued the calls for action on climate. And there's a reason for this, and it's very simple. The wound that was received in Revelation 13 was a loss of political and religious authority and influence. And the healing of the wound, also mentioned in Revelation 13 verse 3, will be a regaining of political and religious authority. When you see articles showing up saying that the Pope is a moral authority on the world stage as it relates to climate, what do you think is going to happen when things really break loose in nature? Well, we're told exactly what's going to happen. The great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And I can assure you that when this happens, the so-called moral authority will be very much involved. The transition is already taking place. The calls are already being made that we need to have days off in order to help the planet heal. Now obviously, it hasn't fully taken on a religious fervor yet, but as natural disasters increase, it most certainly eventually will. It's been 14 years since episode 4 of the original Prophetic Eye series, and I'm even more convinced today of the role that the signs in nature are going to play in the fulfillment of Revelation 13 and 17. What started out as a non-religious movement is now being framed as a moral issue with a moral authority at the head. People of all faiths and non-faiths, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people with all of their differences will be able to find a commonality in the climate change movement, in saving the planet, in stopping the natural disasters. And this will indeed play a role in the eventual calls to return to God that will come from the Christian world. God is continuing to hold the winds to give us an opportunity to know him for ourselves before all the winds are let loose. Now, I don't know if the Pope's flu is an example of those winds being held, but this I do know. Now is the time to make our calling and election sure and to reach every kindred, nation, tongue, and people before they are influenced to go along with the ever-increasing trend. And I pray that you will partner with us to do just that. Is this for real, brothers and sisters? I got you, Pastor. Hold on one second. Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, Adra, you know what Adra is, right? Oh, I was going to do that, yeah. With headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland, is an official COP28 NGO. Brothers and sisters, they're admitted and provisionally admitted Adventist Development and Relief Agency, COP28. But listen to this right here. Listen to this right here. You got to look at it from the standpoint, just giving them the benefit of the doubt. They're probably joining it because of the climate change, not so much the Pope, per se. But for me, 
I don't want to have nothing to do with anything like it, even though it's a good thing in principle. Do you understand this? Unite, act, and deliver. Brothers and sisters, I believe that we need to pull out of that. Am I right? Even mm -hmm. though saving the climate is a good thing, we know who's at the top pushing this. And we're going to talk about this at later on. When we look at what's going on and looking at the fact that faiths are coming together to bring this together, and when Catholics are vowing to carry the Pope's call for climate change, when you see it all on there, they're all about coming together for the purpose, waiting on the world to change. I, I see, hold on. We know why. I don't think we need to, as Adventists, in any way, even though our motives may be good, we know where this is headed. Take it off the screen, Brother Richard. Go ahead. We know why there is climate change. It's sin. Yeah, exactly. Sin. And the further we go towards sin, the worse things will get. Yes. We know this. So if we're really serious as a denomination, as a church, about stopping or preventing or working back climate change, it's real simple. Let's get busy and evangelize. Let's stop being paranoid. Let's stop being schizophrenic. Let's start preaching and believing what we have unapologetically, but with love, and teaching what we were brought here to do. We were not brought here uh, on this planet, okay? So that way we could sound like everybody else. If God wanted another Baptist church, he would have used them. But God didn't. He raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, all of this is for a reason. Okay? We are ashamed of our message. We were ashamed of the health message. Therefore, God used the rocks to use the health message. Okay? We started off meatless meats. And we gave it up because we were afraid of it. And now they're selling it. And they're producing it. And mm. they're making billions off of it. Okay? We're afraid and ashamed of what we believe. So therefore, God uses everybody else. Now please notice what, what the Spirit of Prophecy says mm. in Great Controversy, page 571. 571. She writes the following. She, she says the following. Great Controversy, 571. It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestants than in former times. In other words, there is more that the Protestants have with Catholics than ever before. And she says, it's right. It's true. She wrote this in 1888. There has been a change. But the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism, Catholicism indeed resembles much of Protestantism that now exists. Because why? Protestantism has so greatly re degenerated since the days of the reformers. Now what's happening with us? That's right. Hmm. Why do we want to look like everybody else? That's right. Hmm. Okay? Is there global warming? Yes. yes. And pretty soon, it's going to be boiling because there's going to be a lake of fire. That's right. Okay? Mm. Pretty soon, there's going to be a lake of fire. So you want to see how hot it's going to get? Trust me. You're either inside or you're outside. Mm. And let me tell you, nobody survives outside of the ark. Right. Let's go back to the screen, Brother Richard. Mm. And Pastor Davis, we're going to have you say some words. This thing is, this has been a good study today, right? Amen. But well, we want to make an announcement right now that for those of you that are watching online, we want you to come back on in 45 minutes. In 45 minutes, we're going to come on Zoom. Um, we may start a couple of minutes after that, but what happens is at 7.30 tonight on Zoom is now 6.46. We're going to come back on Zoom and do a Sunday Law update and continue this discussion because this is a very long discussion. And we want you to... Um, Come on Zoom, and of course, the meeting ID is 703-70, excuse me, 
We're going to sit down and come back and talk. And we're going to have, we're going to talk some more on this and some other things in addition to what we're talking about. Pastor Davis, what do you want to say about all this stuff that's going on, man? It's, it's quite evident as we look at all these various things, whether we look at nation, Christian nationalism or whether we look at what the Pope is doing, it's, it's very clear with the climate change movement that all this is headed to uh, Sunday observance and God is trying to get his people ready. You know, um, it's not happenstance that the Pope got sick with the flu and missed going to that uh, COP28. Uh, that was God intervening. Uh, because he sees that his people are not ready. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read this statement right here from Early Writings. Go ahead. This is a good part to end right here. It says in Early Writings, page 38, paragraph 1. This is Sister White speaking. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, hold, hold, hold until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Uh, then reading on uh, page 38, paragraph 2, I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I had heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me, it was God that restrained the powers, that he gave his angels charge over the things on the earth, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. Mm. But while their hands were loosening, and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. Are you listening to this? Whew. And he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him and, he, and that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. And do bro, do bro, you get talking. that? Keep talking. Uh, is, that, is that grasping your attention? God allowed the Pope to get a flu because he looked upon his people. He saw, he saw many of his people still in worldliness, doing things they shouldn't be doing. Dressing like the world, eating like the world. He looked at our institutions, said they're not ready. Our children don't know the three angels' messages. Mercy. He looked at Adra. Like, what are you doing? That's right. He looked at certain officials from the General Conference standing right there in ecumenical meetings. What are you doing? That's right. He says they're not ready. Father, my blood, have mercy. Us, Lord. And God in mercy said, I gotta get my people ready. They're not ready. Everything else in the world is in position. But his church, he wants us to be, be ready. And that's why he's holding things in check. We, we should be saying, thank you, Jesus. And while they, have built, they have, while they have billboards out there promoting the Pope's agenda, we're happy to tell you that we're about to get a fourth one put in New York City area. This billboard you see right here that we have in Birmingham area, Nashville, and also in Meridian, Mississippi, we're about to put this billboard in the New York City area in January next month. Brothers and sisters, I've had, I know that there are people that say that's too strong. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? What, then what do we do? Brothers and sisters, this is the billboard we're getting ready to put out. And we want to ask you, if you want to support us, go to projectladderrain.org, projectladderrain.com. Go to our Zelle and our Cash App to help us. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to come back in 40 minutes, and we're going to finish this discussion on Zoom. Brothers and sisters, this thing is serious. You can take it off the screen, Brother Richard. We want to thank Pastor Davis. Brother Richard, you can take it off the screen now. We want to thank Pastor Davis for helping us. Pastor Q, what are your last words? We have a job to do. 
And if we don't do it, God will raise other people to do it. He is not afraid to. I'm not saying he's, not, he's going to raise up another church. I did not say that. I said that if he will raise up other Others. people to do it. If you're ashamed of this message, don't worry. God has somebody who knows less and is less qualified, yeah. and he will use it. He did it before, and he'll do it again. Now the question is, what are you going to say when you find yourself outside of that city? What are you going to say when you wake up and a thousand years have passed you by? Okay? C.D. Brooks himself says, no one will wail harder and cry louder than a Seventh-day Adventist. Than a Seventh-day Adventist waking up, finding himself outside. I'm asking you to pray that I'm not that one. Amen. Because I know all of you will be there. Okay? So please keep me in your prayers. I appreciate it. God bless you. Amen, man. It's just so good to have Pastor Q. We're going to have you come back to preach for us at State Line. Amen. You ready to have him preach for us? Amen. 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 Our motto at State Line is no smooth sermons allowed. So, but Pastor Q, we just want to let you know we have a policy here at State Line. If you water it down, you can't come back and preach. Amen. Amen. So we thank God. And brother, has Brother Davis passed the test? Yeah. You hope so, right? Because if you water it down, you can't sit on the pulpit no more. Amen. Amen. You heard of Amen. And we got Brother Larry. He's preached for us. He, did he pass a straight? Did Daph, did he pass a straight testimony t policy? He passed it with flying colors. Because if he would have watered it down, we won't have him come back up again. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we want to thank you. We're going to come back in 35 minutes for another Sunday Law update on Zoom. And then, as always, next week we want to come back and give the what testimony? What testimony? Come on, let's do it. The what testimony? Straight testimony. Amen. Get that devil an uppercut, amen? And knock him out, amen, with the truth of the hour, filled with the Holy Ghost power. And it is too sweet to be sour. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for another Sunday Law update. Now we ask for the latter rain to fall upon us. Be with us as we come back in about 35 minutes or so for another Sunday Law update to talk about some things that are going on. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you, and we'll see you at 730 and also next week for another Sunday Law update. Bye-bye.